Welcome to Valente Brothers TV. We're back here at Valente Brothers headquarters in North Miami Beach. Today to talk about the issue of self-defense and the Stand Your Ground law. Currently an issue being debated all over the country. Pedro, why do you feel so strongly about this issue? Well, because we believe this is the right thing for us to do, given our vast experience in teaching self-defense, not only to the general public, but also to law enforcement and the military. When we've been observing all the debates that has been going on with respect to Stand Your Ground, we noticed that all the pundits, all the experts are focusing on how Stand Your Ground applies to somebody who's carrying a gun, somebody who is armed. But we would like to say that Stand Your Ground also protects the unarmed individual who might be attacked and someone who is in a place where they have the right to be. Somebody who's not committing any crime and they are attacked. What rights does that person have? So it's very important that we discuss this element that is being forgotten in this debate, which is so important. We want to make very clear from the get-go that this is not a political video. We are not presenting a liberal point of view and we are not presenting a conservative point of view. We are here to discuss our experience and our expertise, which is in self-defense without weapons and a person's ability to defend him or herself in face of a violent criminal assault. Well, as you said, this is very controversial. Uh, but as you said, we as experts in self-defense, we can provide some good um, analyses and some ideas as far as um, what a person should do and should not do. What is your thought on the duty of retreat? Well, that's the alternative to stand your ground. A lot of people don't really understand what stand your ground means. Stand your ground simply states that a person who is attacked does not have a duty to retreat. All the states who don't have stand your ground, which by the way, are the minority. Most states in America, they have stand your ground statutes, stand your ground provisions in their law. But the states who don't have stand your ground, the alternative to stand your ground, is a duty to safely retreat. And this might pose a danger to the victim who is trying to defend him or herself. In this case, as we're discussing, the unarmed victim who is trying to defend himself or herself against somebody who might have a weapon or not. And even though they say it's a duty to safely retreat, as we understand from our experience in fighting, nothing is completely safe during a fight. It might seem safe later, two or three days later, looking back in hindsight, but at the moment, there's a lot of things happening at the same time, so nothing is going to be completely safe. So it's important that the victim has the ability to do everything that they can reasonably, and reasonably is very important, so that they can survive that situation. Actually, this reminds me of um, a story that happened to me when I was in second grade. I remember the name of uh, my principal, Mr. Woods. Um, I had a fight. Actually, a third grader at the time uh, pushed me, and it was something simple. I pushed him back. I think I threw him down with a jiu-jitsu technique, and we were both taken to the principal's office. And Mr. Woods told me, after asking us what happened, and I told him I was defending myself, he said, look, I don't care. If someone attacks you, I don't want you to fight back. I want you to run to my office immediately. That's what you have to do. And I was very confused. And when I got home, I obviously told the story to my mom, and then I told the story to, to my dad. And as soon as I told the story to my dad, my dad's like, nope, you don't run to his office. You defend yourself, and I'll go talk to him tomorrow. So I think, in a way, there are some parallels. And, and, and our dad said this because also as an expert in self-defense, he understands that running to the principal's office can create a danger because you're going to have to turn your back to be able to retreat. And at that moment, that person can see an opening and use that to grab you, throw you to the ground, kick you in the face, it can be a very dangerous thing to do. As we hear so many stories, and we've actually seen situations 
where people, because of fear, they try to retreat, and in trying to retreat, they actually get thrown to the ground and they get seriously injured and sometimes even killed. And I think we can talk about how jujitsu presents a great option because, yes, there are moments that we teach our students to retreat, especially after escaping an attack. Um, but again, they have that option. And in using jujitsu, our students also have the ability to, in defending themselves, not really hurt the person. And that's the beautiful aspect that jujitsu brings to the conversation. It's true. And through jujitsu, we always teach our students to try to avoid physical confrontation. That's always the first step. You try to diffuse any type of argument. I think that's the evolution of our society and something, society, and that's something that we have to always be aligned with. The idea that you don't want to get into a physical confrontation. You always want to avoid any type of fight. But stand your ground relates to after, to when you're being attacked and how you react. And as we know, many times the safest thing to do is to engage. And somebody else might tell you later, well, you had an opportunity to retreat, but at the moment I didn't feel that that opportunity was my best action that would help me protect myself. And once again, I say, I don't think this is a liberal issue. I don't think this is a conservative issue. I think this protects people who are attacked. And I think this is, a, a, as I said, a universal human right. Because some people, when they criticize Stand Your Ground, they think that it allows for victims or even for unscrupulous unscrup individuals to just say, well, I shot him because I feared for my life and that that would be enough for them to be able to walk. That is very far from the truth. In order for you to be able to use Stand Your Ground, you have to demonstrate that you had a reasonable, a reasonable fear for your life. And that applies to an English common law principle called the doctrine of the reasonable person. And that means that a reasonable person who was in that same situation as you would have acted in the same manner. So it's something that requires the person who defended himself or herself to be able to explain that and to convince a judge or somebody that there was a, um, a real threat. But it's important that we don't think, well, because some people, dishonest people, might use this law in a criminal manner to be able to kill somebody and then use this defense, we cannot abolish this law and then hurt all the others who are using this law to be able to justify I think their legitimate, I, legitimate right to self-defense. And I think what you're talking about is not allowing the whole issue of gun control to interfere with, as you said, our natural right to self-defense. Which is something that, especially, and this is what we are talking about, the unarmed person. So everything we're talking about here today refers to that, the right of the person who's not carrying a gun, who might be a victim of a violent attack, and their ability to defend him or herself and do everything that they can to be able to survive such a criminal attack. Yes. You recently talking to the class about um, the same issue, you talked about how you would put yourself at great risk if you run away from an armed attacker, someone who attacks you, and before running away, you don't know yeah, if they that, have a the weapon. The, that's the whole concept of, exactly, that's the whole concept of, of safely retreating. What does this mean? Because sometimes somebody is armed, and I don't know it because I, I don't see it's concealed. The weapon is concealed. So what am I supposed to do? I have a duty to safely retreat. So after the guy punches me in the face, I'm supposed to tell him, give me one second, please. Let me make sure that you're not carrying any weapons. Okay, and now I run away because now it's safe. Well, it's never 100% safe. And so it's important that the victim of a violent attack who has tried to avoid the situation, who didn't do anything to create that fight, who's just a true victim, who's being attacked, is not forced by the law to run away and has the right to stand his or her ground in self-defense against bullies, against criminals, against people who are out to hurt others. And 
to complete what I was saying before, when people think, well, why not um, take this law because others can use it, use it in a dishonest way? Well, it's the same thing with sexual harassment laws. Are we going to abolish sexual harassment laws because some people might use sexual harassment laws to frame their boss, to dishonestly try to get even with their bosses for another reason? No, you're not going to do that. It's up to our great judicial system, to our great court system, to sort those things out and to be able to prevent people from lying and trying to use a good law to their advantage in a dishonest, in a dishonest way. Yes, I agree. Again, the objective of this video is not to defend the liberal side or the conservative side. It's to defend our right to defend ourselves. Absolutely, and I think it works for both sides. Because both sides of this argument, if they consider that they are law-abiding, and they consider the fact that they might be walking the streets, and they want to be able to stand their ground and not be afraid at a moment that they are fighting for their lives, thinking that if they don't retreat, they might spend the rest of their lives in jail. And then trying to retreat, and then putting themselves in a position where they can get killed. Imagine you try to retreat, the guy pulls a gun and shoots you from the back. Imagine you try to retreat, somebody grabs you from behind, and now your neck is exposed to a choke. And this is why we are bringing this... Or knocks you out. ...with a punch from the back. And this is why we want to participate in this conversation, in this debate. We believe that as experts in self-defense, we can provide a very important contribution because in watching the debates that are going on through the media, we see that some great points are being made, but you don't have anyone out there who understands the reality of a real street fight. And, and Pedro, you mentioned to me in researching about this topic a very interesting number about the percentage of people that actually carry weapons in the United States. It's a very low number. The vast majority of people who walk the streets in our country, the vast majority, they are not armed. And these are the people that we want to protect their rights. We want to make sure that when you don't have a weapon, that you have the right to stand your ground and defend yourself. And this doesn't mean that you're not going to try to avoid the fight, that you're not going to try to defuse the situation. It doesn't mean even that you're not going to retreat if you feel that's the best chance of survival. Retreating can be good, but it should not be imposed on the law-abiding victim of a violent crime, of a violent attack. Good. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. If all of our friends want to send messages and continue this debate, please feel free. We're here to, to share our thoughts and also learn what you guys think and feel about this matter. And we are available to participate in this national conversation. Um, this country has been so good for us and anything we can do to give back and to be able to, to land our experience in this very important time at the, at this, in this country where people are trying to preserve the human rights of self-defense but at the same time reduce violent crime, which is the main objective of this debate. Thank you very much. Thank you.